It's the world this week. The world this week in partnership with the Daily Beast. Uh, joining us from The Hague, Stéphane de Vries, uh, correspondent uh, for French uh, daily newspaper uh, Les Echos. How are things in the Dutch capital? Uh, very well, thank you. Uh, a bit boring, of course, because museums, bars and restaurants are all still closed. Fortunately, shops were allowed to reopen last weekend so people can shop, but until 5 p.m. and then everything closes. So now it's very, very eerily quiet in the streets of the Netherlands. All right. Uh, we're also joined uh, by uh, anne Elisabeth Moutet, a columnist uh, for the Daily Telegraph and the uh, Sunday Telegraph. How are things with you? Uh, fine. I'm I'm stuck home for the weekend because I had lunch with someone who turned out to be positive. So, oh, dear. Uh, I have to self-test for a bit. <laughs> All right. The story of many in existence. Uh, uh, well, you know, hope 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 you see you, you, you stay fine. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, with us as well, former uh, New York Times Moscow uh, correspondent uh, reporter Celestine Bowen. How are things? Very good. Very good. Okay, good. All right. And France 24 Chief International Affairs Editor uh, Robert Parsons. How also good. You're also good. Okay, good. All right. The World This Week, uh, also available, by the way, in the metro, in the car, wherever, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other fine streaming services. It feels almost like last chance talks to stop an eventual war that, well, still remains a mystery. The U.S. and Russian foreign ministers in Geneva, over two months now that uh, Russia has started amassing troops at Ukraine's border, and amid the flurry of diplomacy comes a massive cyber attack recently against Ukraine's government, a thinning out of Russian staff at their embassy uh, in Kiev. And after these talks, promise of more talks, but also uh, strong language. We're not proceeding on the basis of emotion. We're proceeding on the basis of fact and history. Uh, the facts are that Russia has amassed very significant forces uh, on Ukraine's border and continues to do so. Uh, 100,000 troops, most recently, including forces deployed to Belarus. Uh, that would give uh, Russia the capacity, if President Putin so chooses, to uh, attack Ukraine from the south, from the east, from the north. Uh, that wasn't all he said, Robert Parsons. Uh, Anthony Blinken uh, saying that he will, this is one of the big demands from Russia, uh, give uh, answers in writing, something Moscow had been talking about, yeah. to Russian demands. Now, what are those Russian demands and what does Russia ultimately want? That's still the question we're asking. Well, what the Russian demands are is perfectly clear. We've, we, we've known that for some time now. Uh, and we, kn we know what the U.S. response to those demands is going to be because it will be unchanged. The Russians are in insisting that, NATO, that Ukraine should have no path to joining NATO, that other former Soviet uh, countries like Georgia, for instance, Moldova, sh should not have any access to any path to, to joining NATO as well. They're also going further than that, though, and saying that countries that joined NATO after 1997, like Romania and Bulgaria, two countries that were brought up over the last 24 hours, should not be NATO members either, and that NATO should not put uh, its infrastructure or its soldiers into Eastern European countries which were formerly part of the Warsaw Pact. That's just not going to happen. You and know? Russia knows that's not going to happen. So Absolutely. why are they asking? Well, that's the big question. Right. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't think there is a really easy answer to that. I think that's what Antony Blinken, Joe Biden, Stoltenberg and NATO are trying to figure out at the moment what is the end game as far as Russia is concerned. Well, fortunately, Celestine has that. <laughs> Go ahead, Celestine. It's so good that you invited me. Um, no, I don't know. And I do think it's really amazing. I mean, even Russian commentators, even people who are close to the Kremlin say the big question is, what does he want? And why now um, is another part of the same question. We can, we can um, look at a map on this, uh, a new front... Uh, would start because we had the announcement this week of those joint military maneuvers with Belarus. And if you look at that map, uh, you see that, uh, okay, so there might be a front from the north. Uh, there on the map, you see all of the province of Donetsk. They don't control, actually, that port city, Mariupol. But one of the, one of the theories is, is that Russia wants a, a, a land corridor going all the way to Crimea, which is annexed in 2014. Yeah. Uh, there's also the, the idea that maybe they want to annex Donetsk and Luhansk, or maybe they want to make them 
uh, into satellite republics. Right. I mean, I think I think that last one is interesting because it was uh, tabled as a bill by the communists, actually, mm. in the Russian legislature, the Duma. Um, and, uh, you know, actually Lavrov was asked about it today and he kind of, you know, skirted the issue. But it's bizarrely maybe what they'll kind of settle for because in my view, the dangerous thing here is that Vladimir Putin has put all this in place, and um, there may be some off-ramps about <clears throat> arms control, about where placing which missile where, and so on. Mm. But he has to have a pretty big off-ramp <laughs> to get out of this right yeah. now without going at least somewhere. And the somewhere could be Donetsk and Lugansk, which are, as you said, much smaller than what was on the map. Um, and the, and this past putting, history the, as well. uh, uh, recognizing them as sovereign states, which he's done before in, in uh, breakaway regions of Georgia, exactly. and uh, yeah. Yeah. made them kind of so-called independent states, recognized I think by two other countries. Right. Um, but you know that would allow him them to invite him in. I mean, you know, it would sort of you know. But I, I think the scary thing is he. So your he, off ramp includes. Uh, no, no, a measure I, of military action is what no, you're saying. No, no, I mean, I'm saying there, uh, diplomatically, I think there are things available, but they won't make him look like he hasn't backed down. Sorry for the yeah. double negative. I mean, he, you know, the, the guy is not somebody who's going to want to lose face on this. And um, if he just goes away with a diplomatic, you know, bunch of papers... It looks like he backed down. All right. On Wednesday, in the buildup to Geneva, there was, well, let's call it what it was, a blunder. It came during Joe Biden's press conference to mark one year in office as U.S. president. I think what you're going to see is that Russia will be held accountable if it invades. And it depends on what it does. It's one thing if it's a minor incursion and then we end up having a fight about what to do and not do, et cetera. But if they actually do what they're capable of doing with the force amassed on the border, it is going to be a disaster for Russia if they further invade Ukraine. That minor incursion uh, comment, uh, Anne Elizabeth, the, the White House, the State Department, they spent all day Thursday rolling it back, clarifying it, denying it. Uh, did Biden actually blurt out what is the thinking in Washington? I imagine that he it didn't come out of the blue. Um, and I don't know how much of his capacity he's got uh, left from the time when he was the extremely competent head of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Senate. But that's, you know, that's uh, that was a different time. Uh, but in a sense, it almost does not matter because what not only there has been damage control in Washington, but uh, Blinken was basically doing damage control in Moscow opposite Lavrov. And it reminds me very much of those uh, sort of Brexit negotiating sessions in which uh, uh, the various Tory negotiators were fighting among themselves while Michel Barnier was sitting back relaxed. Uh, it's it's given Russia so much, uh, uh, so much sort of... Uh, of a pressure point and in a sense russia believes in force and that was just an admission of weakness and of a place where you could where you could push um i think it's disastrous i think most people do not realize how uh, dangerous it is for the rest of Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, already Russia has demands on, on what members of the European Union and members of NATO should be doing and should not be doing. And if we, if we, so if we as the West and NATO are as climb down in, in Ukraine, then it will follow up, you know, like night follows day. Uh, so no, I think we're in a very dangerous situation. It's of the making of this American government, who having lost Afghanistan are pretty pretty much ready, it would seem, for some of them to lose Ukraine as well. Some of them ready to lose Ukraine? Is that your assessment, Stefan de Vries? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that Europe is really uh, ready to defend Ukraine. Uh, however, at what price? That is, of course, the big question. Um, I think many European capitals now are more or less um, a little bit annoyed by the fact that uh, two 
blocs talk about their security over their heads. Uh, the European Union is not really involved in these talks, uh, yet uh, it's the first bloc that will be affected by a potential war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, which is actually a war by proxy against the European Union, uh, because, of course, the, the whole purpose of Russia, if, if there is a purpose uh, of this potential war, is, of course, to make clear to the European Union that they don't want other countries to become part of the European Union nor uh, part of NATO. So um, the European Union will be briefed on Monday in Brussels. The ministers of foreign affairs will gather in Brussels and get their briefing uh, by Anthony Blinken, who will join um, them on online, so virtually. Um, but that shows um, how, well, basically we're, we're bystanders. Euro Brussels and, and the other European countries are, are bystanders. Bru they're they're, they're this, bystanders. And let me let confusing me... and potentially very dangerous conflict. Yeah, and by the way, on that score, it wasn't just Biden ruffling feathers on Wednesday. That was the day Emmanuel Macron made his big speech in Strasbourg at the European Parliament to mark France's yeah. six-month rotating presidency of the EU. And it featured, let's listen to it, a call for the bloc to chart its own course. À la fois pour nous-mêmes comme pour la Russie, pour la sécurité de notre continent qui est indivisible, nous avons besoin de ce dialogue. Nous devons, nous Européens, poser collectivement nos propres exigences et nous mettre en mesure de les faire respecter. Un dialogue franc, exigeant face aux déstabilisations, aux ingérences, aux manipulations. So chart our own course, a frank dialogue. Uh, that spooked a lot of NATO allies, Stefan. Yes, indeed, but it was later more or less well corrected by um, Macron's advisors uh, by saying that it's nothing else than the concept of strategic autonomy that Macron has been promoting since he became a president and uh, which has now found um, a lot of support in, in, in most of the European capitals. But the timing was maybe um, uh, not very lucky. Uh, but in, 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 a, in a way, Macron is right, of course, by saying that we should actually find our own voice, our own dialogue, or our own position um, in in this this geopolitical um, conflict. Uh, we will not. We don't need. Well, it's it's very hard to be stay in be dependent on the United States, um, especially of course after the Trump era. Especially since also um, we realize that the United States is no longer the ally ally um, that we had in the in the 70s or the 80s during the Cold War. Uh, the time has changed. Um, so his message um, was received, well, with, with a lot of raised eyebrows. And at the same time, um, there is absolutely need for the European Union to find its own voice and its own uh, place in, in the new world. Well, let's hear what the Russians think of that. The foreign minister in Geneva sending, well, a pretty blunt message. He's happy to talk to the US, but as for the EU... <laughs> Our concerns are not about imaginary threats, but about real fights that no one hides. Pumping Ukraine with weapons, sending hundreds of Western military instructors to Ukraine. Uh, now the European Union, fearing it's lagging behind NATO, wants to create its own military training mission in Ukraine. This will be quite an interesting turn in the ambitions of the European Union, which apparently wants to remind itself in this way, because the EU is not very visible in serious negotiations. So, Elizabeth Mute, I haven't seen anything about this EU training mission. What we have seen, though, is uh, the British this week airlifting anti-tank weapons and uh, military instructors uh, to Ukraine. What, what's your reaction when you listen to Sergei Lavrov? Well, not just the British, but some Eastern European countries as well, including Estonia, the Baltic states, uh, and movements in, in Poland as well, because they know exactly what the threat is like, and it's been at their border for a long time. Uh, I think Sergei Lavrov is, you know, he's within his role as as the, um, uh, uh, you know, as a Russian and as an heir of a, of a, a tradition of diplomacy of force. Um, uh, but of course, what they do is they they put the onus on Europe and they say, oh, you're helping Ukraine defend itself as an act of aggression. Uh, it's not much change since the Cold War. And and we had threats at the time. And let's just hope that they at the last minute blink, if I 
may allow this. And that brings us back to what you were saying earlier, Celestine, about how big an off-ramp for Vladimir Putin. I mean, uh, again, we don't know. Um, and we don't, because we don't know what it, his own end game was in his own mind. I mean, I have to say in terms of the sort of battle readiness of these troops going in, I mean, I've heard actually from French military strategists and, um, you know, that said there are sort of missing elements that to anything could suggest an, a full-on invasion. I mean, there's not really the supply in hospital sort of... Um, yeah, and the guesstimates vi vary wildly yeah. between the Russians will roll into to, right. to, to Kiev or they may suffer big losses. So I think, I think there's an element of bluff here for sure. I'm just, you know, I think the idea of a full-out invasion is probably never really been in the cards. I know that that's not what some people say, but... You know, at the end of the day, they would be fighting a brother nation. I mean, it, it's it's in, it's sort of unimaginable how damaging that could be yeah. um, for him domestically. So, as somebody said, I was talking to in Moscow. You know, when the first coffin comes back, you know that. So, you have yeah, to, but he is capable of controlling the domestic debate quite quite he well. He does, and yeah. he also manages to hide the coffins, um, yeah, and he makes yeah, sure that exactly. the people can't get to the cemeteries. But having said that, if it were a full-on one, I think that would be difficult. I, yeah. I'm just I'm sort of wondering whether he's thinking of this smaller incursion, which yeah. um, I mean, I just wonder. You were mentioning earlier on the idea of slicing off the southeastern part, part of Ukraine. Right. He could, there's no doubt that the Russians are quite capable of doing that. They've got the, they've got the hardware, they've right. got the manpower in place to do it. Right. But the question I ask myself about that is what do they actually achieve by doing that? That's because right. if the aim, as Putin has suggested over, the, over the, uh, the last few weeks or so, is to ensure that Ukraine is pulled back into Russia's orbit, yeah. I think by doing that you achieve exactly the opposite. Absolutely. Because you ensure that Ukrainians forever loathe the which Russians. He, which he al already has. I actually listened to the... Uh, to the press conference, and Bi uh, Biden, Blinken at the end said <clears throat> that he had brought up with Lavrov something that's so obvious, which is that if Russia was concerned about a country next to it being pulled in the Western orbit, they've done everything, yeah, exactly. everything possible mm -hmm. to make that happen. The, mm -hmm. the support for NATO before 2014 in Ukraine was about 30 percent. It's now 60 and up. Um, if they were to invade I, you know, it goes through the roof. So it goes I mean, the roof. I think that that's that's the kind of we could part see an of air the campaign. I think. I don't know. I'm not. I have no idea. I know it's it's what they did in Georgia actually in two two thousand and eight. Having they brought troops in and then the Georgian air force is pretty small. The Ukrainian air force is not very big either. Right. But I think the first step that the Russians would take would be to obliterate uh, Ukrainian defences, well, including, including their air force, obviously, right. and, uh, well, that's and then a, follow that's in. A full on, that's yeah. a full-on That's invasion. a full-on invasion, yeah. 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 Britain's role, we were talking earlier about those anti-tank weapons, those military structures going in. It's getting little play domestically, not when you have a uh, backbench revolt against a sitting prime minister taking form. And a Tory MP who gets up in the House of Commons to cross the aisle and join the opposition ranks. His name is Christian Wakeford. He was elected in 2019 in a constituency north of Manchester that was part of the so-called Red Wall that turned against Labour and handed Johnson his landslide majority. On Wednesday in the Commons, uh, the PM, who had seemed on the ropes the previous day, uh, had uh, more fight. He issued a thinly veiled threat. And I say, right honourable gentlemen, that the Conservative Party uh, won Bury South for the first time in generations under this Prime Minister uh, with an agenda of uniting, uniting and levelling up and delivering for the people of Bury South. And Mr Speaker, we will win again in Bury South at the next election. Minister. Nice constituency you got there. You wouldn't want something to happen to it, right, Elisabeth Moutet? <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is this is really Boris on his hind legs. I understand that in the term of the MP who actually crossed the aisle to uh, join the Labour Party, he there is a story which is now being heavily denied that the chief whip uh, threatened him uh, with with uh, deselecting him for the next um, uh, election, and that of course would definitely sort of put, you know, uh, make somebody angry enough to cross the aisle. But it's a rare occurrence. There's only been, according to Politico, 23 times in the last 30 years that uh, uh, a member of parliament has switched uh, uh, allegiances. 
Um, I don't, I mean, it happens from time to time and I, people remember it. I don't have my figures to be entirely honest, um, but it, it happens from time to time, but it rarely from conservative to labor. You've got all sorts of conservatives going to Lib Dem, uh, but uh, lots of people go to Lib Dem as a kind of holding pen, a bit like sports, but um, not this. Like Winston but, Churchill. <laughs> Well, it happened to Churchill, and the, the man who crossed the aisle twice, of course, uh, was Oswald Mosley, the, the fascist leader who first um, crossed the aisle to, uh, 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 who was a, he was a conservative, he crossed to Labour, and then he became an independent. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying it applies to any, any part of the situation today. I think we don't have evilness there, but a great deal of incompetence. However, I'd like to point out, to link it to the previous uh, topic, that Boris Johnson took the decision to send a uh, uh, plane loads of anti-tank uh, armament into to Ukraine. Anti-tank armament is not something you use to be aggressive yourself. It's something that you use to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's exactly like the three million passports that he uh, offered immediately to residents of Hong Kong when there was the Chinese government crackdown. Uh, Boris makes many mistakes, but he does hear, you know, he, he does hear the cry of freedom and, and the threats on freedom. And that's something I'm not even sure it's going to help him at this stage in domestic policy. I think you've got one of those um, rare accents and uh, acts and uh, 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 Sorry, you've got those rare instances where Boris is being completely honest on something. I'm pretty sure the Foreign <laughs> Office was less, less uh, keen on this than he was. I, I don't even think it was. It had anything to do. And he got the support of Tom Tugendhat, the um, uh, the Tory chairman of the, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of, the, of Commons, who is absolutely no Boris supporter. Right. So a rare instance of sincerity, as you say. Uh, Johnson, uh, meanwhile, on the domestic scene, well, he's fighting for his job and he's digging in. It's getting ugly. One rebel Tory urging colleagues to report actions of intimidation to the party or even go to the police, <laughs> as uh, uh, the front page story in The Times of London reads. Uh, uh, Robert Parsons. This is the part for all of us who are not British don't understand. <laughs> he wins with a 79-seat majority, yeah. a landslide. It's two years later, and suddenly he's got a leadership contest. It's like a hung parliament again, even well, though he's got this big majority? He's got a big majority, but he could... He could, he could I think what the, the problem for him is that... He, his MPs are looking forward, and they're, they're, they're seeing that he's losing by-elections. There are local elections coming up as well. The Conservative Party outside Parliament is getting nervous about how this is going to develop down the line. Uh, and with, another, with one of his own MPs switching sides, that feeling grows even stronger. So, and, and, and with talk, too, of the Red Wall MPs meet, meeting in, the, in, the, in the, the north of England or the North Midlands, discussing about whether they should send their letters to the 1922 committee to set off a no-confidence vote, that feeling grows even stronger. So that's what it's all about at the moment. That's why his position is shaking. Has he lost the Conservative Party? I, th I think nationwide, outside of the Parliament, it looks like he's beginning to lose it. And part of the reason for that is that, at the moment, his rating is extremely low, lower even than Theresa May's uh, was at, it, at its lowest, uh, and the Labour Party now has a 10% lead, according to the latest opinion polls. You know, after the Conservative Party had that colossal lead before, so the, the the tide looks like it's beginning to turn. And when that starts to happen, things get on a roll, and it can be very difficult sometimes for a Prime Minister, particularly one uh, who, who, in many respects, is is regarded, you know, through through. Uh, rather askance by the British public, loved in some senses because he's a, you know, a rogue, but at the same time regarded as somebody who doesn't often tell the truth. Uh, so yeah, I, that, know, it, it's a position, you know, his position of strength is one that can easily be lost, I think. Yeah, and, uh, this, this coming, this drama within the Conservative Party, uh, and it's all about, as Rob was saying, this loss of credibility. Uh, remember, this is about uh, parties that happen at the height of lockdown. Uh, Inside uh, 10 Downing Street, staffers at that May 2020 Bring Your Own Booze lockdown party uh, broke a swing in the Garden of Downing Street, thus this cartoon by Banks in the Financial Times. Uh, he fell off a child's swing during a work event. The work event is <laughs> the excuse. I thought I was attending a work event. Uh, that was perhaps one too many uh, by Boris Johnson for the former Brexit minister, David Davis, in the Commons. Like many on these benches, I spent weeks and months defending the Prime Minister uh, against often angry constituents. I reminded them of his success in delivering Brexit, 
and on the vaccine and many other things. But I expect my leaders to shoulder the responsibility for the actions they take. Yesterday, he did the opposite of that. So I'll remind him of a quotation altogether too familiar to him of Leo Amory to Neville Chamberlain. You have sat there too long for all the good you have done. In the name of God, go. And he's a bit mouté. Has uh, Boris Johnson lost the Conservative Party? He may well have. He is, I mean, all everybody uh, you talk to in London reminds you that this is really crafty animal uh, behind the bumbling exterior. Uh, and uh, he may yet sort of save himself, but I think he's really in danger. I think um, uh, 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 Robert is quite right that, uh, in a sense, it's all this battle is happening within the party, that people have, that the Labour has got a 10% lead may not be something that would actually happen in the polls, and it's still two years. Um, for the election. But within the party, we've seen other instances of the leader uh, sort of becoming noxious for the future of the party and being ruthlessly fired. And of course, there's the uh, 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 the, the best known um, uh, uh, example of that was Margaret Thatcher in 1990, uh, in which the, the party decided that with the poll tax, she'd absolutely pull something that would make them lose seats in droves. And uh, with a the result, they uh, there was a coup. Uh, masterminded, I would like to sort of remind everyone that uh, by Michael Heseltine, who was the foreign secretary and who was afterwards never going to get any important job in his life. He wanted to be the prime minister. That's one of the reasons uh, why probably Boris might stay a few more weeks. It's because there are two very obvious uh, successors, and they actually are seated uh, on the picture on the television right now, uh, uh, on either side of him, Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, and Rishi Sunak, the, um, uh, uh, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And both of them do not want to be the ones pushing because uh, it's very well known that the party doesn't like traitors and that somebody else would get the job. Uh, it's getting very Florentine and right. absolutely fascinating to watch. <laughs> I still think Boris is in danger. All right, so don't be the one to stick the dagger in first and don't show your hand too soon. The advice there from Henry <laughs> Zabet. Now, France can't rival with Partygate, but it does have a COVID restrictions related scandal involving a party destination. Let's try to set the scene here. France has a very stern education minister who used to be the all-powerful chancellor of schools. January 2nd, this is the night before the end of Christmas break, fury among teachers, Jean-Michel Blanquer in his interview with Le Parisien unveils yet more new COVID restrictions before he'd even spoken to the unions. Now it transpires that unlike what you see in the photo, the interview wasn't at the office at all, <laughs> but on the phone from Ibiza. Blanquer had gone away for a prenuptial holiday before marrying his third wife, a journalist. That was last Saturday. Needless to say, that did not endear him to teachers. They staged their second walkout in as many weeks. Uh, for now, uh, the, though, uh, Blanquer uh, refusing to resign. On Tuesday, he faced the music in Parliament. It's good. Did I miss any meetings? or any other work I was supposed to get done over that period because of my presence there? Of course not. Also, would the decisions have been different if I had been somewhere else? No. I will admit that there was something symbolic in my choice of destination. I should have picked another one. I regret that symbol. There really is a parallel, Stéphane de Vries, uh, with politicians seeming out of touch. Yeah, well, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of this minister, but that, that's not really important. I think he has a point when he says that the destination was a symbol, because imagine that he would have gone on holiday on the Ile de Porquerolles or Ile de Léron, eh, the very uh, fashionable islands of the coast of, 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 the, of France, where many bourgeois French uh, go for their holidays, then there would be no problem. But it was Ibiza, which is, of course, part of the European Union, so basically it is still his own country, but it is, of course, <laughs> also a symbol of um, parties, uh, debauchery, drugs, etc. Um, and I think it's very There's hard no pictures for many of him at parties. to imagine uh, the president there dancing uh, high on ecstasy. Um, uh, of course, it, it was not smart from an image point of view. Uh, but we have defending uh, or actually uh, tr trying to introduce uh, teletravail, uh, working at home uh, all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm, you, you think I'm sitting in the Netherlands, but actually outside it's Ibiza as well with many parties. 
seeing girls at the swimming pool. So it is actually a bit of a. Um, I, I, th I think it's it's a bit of a. Um, it, it's not really fair to him. Although I do agree, the image is it's it's not smart to go there. But he, he, he here's the heart of the illegal. matter. So um, it was just a silly communication mistake. Yeah. It, here's the heart of the matter, Celestine Bowen, which is that it's been really. We know it's been hard on healthcare workers, but it's also been hard on right. teachers. Uh, they have to deal with protocols that change all the time. Uh, whether or not the kids have to be tested in the classroom, primary school teachers has been particularly difficult for them. They've been asking for better ventilation systems and, and clear rules because they spend a lot of their time checking who's a contact case, who's not. They're not able to teach right now, and that's frustrating for them. For them and for the parents, obviously. That's an even bigger constituency that's probably pretty pissed off. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it's, as uh, you were saying, it's about communication and it's also timing. I mean, this was the night that he was announcing a new set of rules that threw everybody again back into chaos. Parents scrambling, should they test, should they take the kids, should they take it out, should they take them out? Um, and I think it was just, you know, just not well thought out. Let's just put it that way. And these teachers don't earn a lot of money. Uh, Again, this is a very French story, Robert Parsons, because <laughs> Jean-Michel Blanquer is what they call a Mandarin. He's from the, you know, the, the high instances of the educational civil service machine. And yeah. so this idea of him giving that interview from Ibiza, that's what's annoying to people. It's, it's riled people, you know, particularly when we were talking about teachers, people who've been suffering on, on the front line. And to have the, the Mandarin, as you put it, sending his message for the for what they're going to have to do in the future from the island of Ibiza is you know obviously too much for people. you know I absolutely agree with Stefan I don't think he's done anything outrageously wrong but it, it was at the very least ill-advised and Elizabeth Moutet uh is this uh will this pass it's just for the current news cycle well it depends entirely whether Emmanuel Macron wants to make a gesture in the last two months before the presidential election, because it's well known now that Jean-Michel Blanquer is out of favor. Jean-Michel Blanquer was an appointee who was uh, presented to her husband by Brigitte Macron, who herself is a, is a, was a school teacher, professor in a high school uh, with great a great reputation. Uh, and he was the man who was supposed to be bringing in the uh, uh, sort of the right-wing electorate or the center-right electorate by defending French universalism, battling wokeism, the there was a convention at the Sorbonne University only uh, last week, which was all about wokeism and that annoyed uh, the quote-unquote woke party no end. Uh, but uh, in recent months, it's been said that Jean-Michel Blanquer has not well handled restrictions in schools or indeed the state of the schools themselves. And I don't know whether you know how much traction his enemies have, but I've been told that uh, he's not the golden boy anymore. And therefore, the question remains to be asked, you know, who leaked it? Who, who, uh, who it, of course, the security had to know that he was in Ibiza, but uh, who leaked it? All right. Who did leak it? Well, well, maybe the other shoe will drop. As you say, two months to go before the presidential election uh, here in France, a little more than two months. And uh, speaking of musical and COVID protests, uh, I got to say, Stefan de Vries, the Dutch do it differently. Uh, we saw images this week of haircuts during a symphony orchestra performance, uh, part of a protest against uh, the government uh, keeping uh, cultural uh, venues uh, shut. They there you see the image there. Uh, I thought we were the champions when it comes to demonstrating, Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Dutch do it differently and, and maybe more, more ironically, because of course this was an ironic protest, uh, because since last Saturday hairdressers and sports clubs are allowed to reopen. But nevertheless, theatres and museums are still closed as part of the lockdown, the, the, the fight against the pandemic. Now, uh, a very clever theatre maker and national TV host, Diedrich Ebbinger, um, he thought, well, if hairdressers can open, why not transform theatres into hairdressers? <laughs> so he proposed that to one of the theatres in Amsterdam that immediately said yes, and quickly followed by dozens of others, other theatres and museums. Um, and so they protested on Wednesday um, in, in this way. They, they were 
local barbershop theatres, um, the mayors of the cities who are actually responsible uh, to maintain the rules were not happy. Uh, they warned uh, several theatres. Um, in some places, the police intervened to close those places. But nevertheless, they got more or less what they wanted because uh, the whole issue was that it is ridiculous that you can walk around in a department store nowadays in the Netherlands, but not in a museum. And it seems that the government has heard their protest um, and probably uh, tomorrow or in the next couple of days, the Prime Minister Mark Rutte will announce that cultural venues can reopen again. Um, so it has helped. It was a very um, fun and smart protest. Um, there were no, there was, were no incidents, no violence, no arrests were made. Um, and the cultural sector made their point very their clear um, in a very smart way. All right. Uh, all that was missing were barbershop quartets. Uh, <laughs> staying in the Netherlands, a team of investigators using 21st yeah. century cold case methods believe they've cracked the mystery of who turned Anne Frank into the Nazis during World War II. A Canadian academic, a retired FBI agent, Dutch researchers together pointing the finger at a Jewish notary called Arnold van der Berg, this in a bid to save his own family from deportation, they say. I'm impressed by, uh, by the research done by this uh, cold case team, but I'm not uh, uh, impressed and convinced by the, the results of it. All right, so there you heard uh, uh, Stefan de Vries. There are plenty of doubting Thomases uh, uh, where you are, and the authors themselves say they're not 100% certain. No, absolutely. This was one of the biggest stories this week in the Netherlands. It was actually all part of a publicity campaign for a new book, uh, The uh, Betrayal of Anne Frank. Now, the news broke on Tuesday uh, when the makers of a documentary that was broadcast also in, in the United States uh, revealed that they discovered the real person who tr who had betrayed Anne Frank's family. Anne Frank, of course, was uh, being um, in, in hide hidden in the uh, what is now called the Anne Frank House, one of the most visited museums of the country. Um, but she was betrayed, and she and her family were deported to Auschwitz, where they were murdered. Um, now um, the news was that there was probably a notary from Amsterdam who betrayed this family. The investigators, um, it was a former. A FBI agent. Um, it was a cold case team. So many terms that are very popular now were used this week to reveal actually the news about Anne Frank's traitor. Um, uh, allegedly, it was then a notary, a Jewish notary, which was also a, a poignant detail. Um, so all the media were talking about that. And then for in the following days, more and more historians were becoming more critical because the book was not available to um, read before the publication. Many media had to sign um, non-disclosure agreements with very heavy fines. So um, the media were not able to check everything that was in the book. So there was a lot of criticism. Um, uh, Jewish organizations, some U Jewish organizations said that, that this was ad actually adding to feelings of anti-Semitism because if Anne Frank was betrayed indeed by a Jewish notary, well, that will give fuel to anti-Semites. Um, so it was a, a very controversial week, a very mm. controversial statement. Probably, it's, it's very hard to say if it's true or not. Uh, the uh, discussion is still ongoing. St still ongoing. And Boutet, the author, is saying that they're not uh, passing judgment uh, on, on that Jewish notary. It was a time, after all, where people were trying to save themselves. But there's the other aspect to this story. Here in France, we've just, um, uh, the police have just uh, started setting up a cold case unit because with new technology, uh, new ways of using artificial intelligence, uh, it's thought that we're going to be able soon to solve a lot more cases. Is this a question? Yeah. So what would your, yes. your, your thoughts uh, on this? And I have, I have, you know, cold cases uh, in, you know, in murder investigation. I find this fascinating in the, uh, and I, you know, I think it's a good thing. Why not? I'm, I'm extremely dubious because there's some, is no such thing as the Anne Frank case. There's the fact that uh, um, almost 100,000 Jews out of a small country like uh, uh, the Netherlands were murdered. And uh, the, uh, the, the local authorities, some of the local authorities collaborated. And uh, the fact that then you put people in an impossible situation, such as 
if he is guilty, the notary who suddenly finds himself desperately trying his family and, and the, it brings out the worst in him. But if you read Primo Levi in what happened in concentration camps, you know very well that people who were terrified and hungry did horrible things and it amused their captors. So I think solving this as if it were a, a police case is, is a mistake. It's a historical mistake and it's a philosophical mistake. I have a problem with that. But, you know, by all means, solve crimes that we don't know about. I still do not know who uh, Jack the Ripper was and I'm interested. <laughs> Celestine Bowen. And I was just saying, I mean, I was thinking it's kind of interesting that this man's name had appeared from the typewriter of Anne Frank's father. So it was actually a clue that's been out there for, you know, as many years as he was, you know, able to talk about it. And, um, you know, and then it all comes full circle with AI and, you know, all sorts of, you know, fancy um, detective work. But, I mean, at the end of the day, he was a prime suspect already, and now he's still a suspect. I mean, he's dead. But Right. And, as, and and so what's, I mean, where did we, you know, where are and we as today? Stefan says, it's difficult to pass judgment if you haven't yet been able to read the book. Well, that's so, true. Celestine Bowen, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Robert Parsons. I want to thank Stefan de Vries in The Hague and Elisabeth Moutet. Thank you for being with us here in The World This Week. Thank you.